All right, here we go. Game three. Golden Guardians up against the wall. BDS is playing fantastically, and they were able to get some trades. Golden Guardians kind of threw away their advantage. Uh, if they had just followed the script maybe a little bit more, they could have they could have taken advantage, but we're seeing some really nondescript plays from them. They are able to get Ivern from this draft. We have on the S tier on the junglers. They also have Jax. And Garen coming up into Jax. They're very happy to play this champion again. Hoping to take advantage of the fact that Golden Guardians didn't seem like they knew how to play against it. Right? Just Garen being this ultimate threat, always in your face, always presenting a threat. Plus, with the backing of Oriana, who might be the strongest mid laner on this patch. Uh, we have Oriana and Talia uh, right up there with um, Syndra and Azir slightly behind. But with Oriana shields, Rakan shields, the fact that you have Sejuani to help be a dive brother means that you have plenty of advantages that you can take. Now, it looks like Licorice is opting to take the Renekton approach, right? We're going to play Jax with Grasp and try to win this lane with Grasp procs. I absolutely love this. As soon as you see Counter-Strike come up, that's when the spin comes out. Oh, the early flash. Sejuani with an early path. Did you see that flash? Over the pit, despite Ivern having a ward, this is worth pausing. See this ward right here? This is something that doesn't happen nearly enough, but it happens in the highest, highest levels. Flash this wall from Sejuani. Also, notice that they're rocking the Hextech flash traption, so they're still going to have access to uh, wall jumping abilities to be able to save their Q for the actual continuation on these fights. Very important against champions like Azir and against Zaya. Uh, is able to jump the wall, steal red, gank top, unbeknownst, despite the early ward, they think that they know that Sejuani's not there. Sejuani's able to take that, and they cr they basically win this game at level one. So, so nice. Now, this is the sort of thing that when you're talking about what is an analyst's position, what should an analyst be doing and an advanced scout? Advanced scout is the person on your team that is responsible for checking out your next opponent and seeing what they do. All right. Um, so, for example, um, er Ernie is a favorite one, is a famous one for the Patriots. He was able to go out and say, "Here's a play that the Seahawks have run uh, with high amounts of success. They could run this play. It might show up at a clutch moment, uh, and so you should put some practice reps in it." And so the Patriots famously put 20 reps in against the pick I don't, I don't want to play it the the pick and shallow cross route that got run against them on the final play of the Super Bowl and Malcolm Butler intercepted it and he didn't even get a rep but just the fact that his team or he did get reps he didn't succeed at them ever but they were able to see it coach it talk about it and when it came up in the game Brandon Browner was like, I know what's coming. Swap with me. I'm going to front this guy and allow it to happen. You can exploit plays if you know they're coming. So when we talk about what are teams' tendencies, where do they ward? What time do they ward? At what time do those wards go down? Those are things that are exploitable in these games. Now, very importantly, you've got the early stacks off, passing the kill off, also very important. Uh, if you know... That enemy team never wards this position or if you had one ward out early which they accomplished early i want to talk about this again for a second it's actually worth coming back for it 12 23. see these two wards right here i want to go back to the moment that they got this blue ward down super super early basically a rush into the game oriana comes to mid Ezreal and Rakan. Rakan is taking the most defensive ward possible, saying we want to see any sort of late invades that come over here. Ezreal is going to check out this area to just see if if any anything except for this path is now covered. All right, for red team. And in the meantime, Oriana is checking out mid, so you see anyone coming in through these avenues. Garen's can step up to make sure that nothing's happening behind them. So really, they've got three people, maybe even four, that could come to this fight for the Sejuani. Sejuani's going to come lay out this deep ward, get it out early at 50 seconds, basically about the earliest you can get it out. This does a couple of things. It'll see this path here. It'll see most of Ivern's paths. Now, you can beat this ward by going behind, for example. 
But when you see this ward or when you get this ward done, you get a little bit more information. Now check out what happens with the rest of the team. They see the Jacks. Now they see the Ivern. Now they see the Ivern ward or no? This sees to about right here. So right now, Ivern's just toggling in and out of vision. I wish that they would put this on. I, mm, this is very, very close. I can't tell with my naked eye whether or not this ward sees this ward. But regardless of that, you saw Jacks path through. You saw Ivern going back to his bush, and he never went towards this area. They saw him constantly, and they see him path here. So now the limits are who could have possibly warded on their entire team? Only Jax. Jax is the only person who could have warded. And important that it's Jax, because Jax never wards. Jax never wards because they need their ward for their ward hop. So when he has this, he's using it at level two. He's saving his wards that he has ward hop. Sejuani can infer that this path is completely unobstructed and that no one will be there. Top lane is going to be fighting for Pryo. They're going to be fighting for level one. Jax will almost definitely be there, which means Sejuani can jump into this. Not only that, but Orianna has wonderful push at level one with the Q spam, right? Has one of the best pushing abilities at level one. Garen has one of the best pushing abilities at level one as well, although he does lose his fights until he gets a couple more levels of stats. This all being told, all together, equates to Sejuani being able to jump this wall completely unbeknownst to enemy team, flashes the wall so that he can still have access to his, to his, I presume W for the clear, although he might've gone E. Yeah, so he went E right here, solo clear, this is fine. Uh, you're gonna have, yeah, you know what? It had to be E so that he could have EQ. You go E on one camp so that you can go Q. The level of preparation present in BDS, and this is the thing that we have exalted this team for. They come in with the most unique strategies and preparations and, the casters were talking about this in the sense of we know they're going to cheese. They're the cheesy team, so we can like not get cheesed. That's not how it works. If, unless you can define exactly what the cheese is and exploit it with an answer, then you are falling victim to optimal game theory or game theory optimal as, as uh, poker pundits would have it. When you're using advanced game theory, you are using this advantage to the maximum. You're becoming unpredictable with some split that usually looks like 60%, 30%, 10%. 60% being my best strategy, 30% being something the, that answers the answer to my best strategy, and 10% being something out of left field that is so unpredictable like this that we can say, all right, we know what our 60 is, what our 30 is, what our 10 is. We know what their likely answers are. In this case, we saw exactly what the Ivern did. Yep, boom, we can make this play. I'm flashing this wall. This was clearly prepared for because he's got Hextech flash traption. Uh, this entire play is scripted out. It is a way to just take an astronomical lead to start this game and crush the team morale, right? Like apart from just the numbers, Think of what it does when you think that you've prepared this whole strategy. Okay, I'm going to path bottom to top. I've warded here. Sejuani's not invading me. I know I'll be able to get to top side and we'll be able to play for a level three, level four, wave three through five fight in top lane. And suddenly your entire plan gets washed by this play. Sejuani's able to take the camp with her E. She uses smite, presumably, almost definitely. No, saving smite? Okay. You know what? Saving smite because they had the second proc of the E available. That makes sense. Now still has smite for an available fight. Going to sit right here at the edge of vision. I don't think... No, they are seen right here. All right, so they're seen. So there's nothing about that, but able to use the gap close. I imagine this also means that we have blue tree second, uh, probably for Nimbus Cloak to get that movement speed. I'm not positive without seeing the runes this game. Jumps in gets the auto, gets the E, red buff, slows down, waits for the jump, boom, hits it. I could go for days on just that segment alone. Like we could do an entire video on just that one play. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic BDS, love it. Now Sidrani with Smite available is able to accelerate their second, uh, I'm not even gonna call it their second path. Ooh, neat mechanic from Ivern. Wait, I did not know about this. What is this precisely? All right, so they're both leashed. So Q and cancel. So that the Q animation goes over there, you lock in and then you reactivate Q to get both. 
Uh, I mean, it's a small little thing, but if you save yourself two seconds on your clear, good for you. Need to, need to see that level of mastery. You clearly talk to the one tricks uh, when that's the case. So that's another thing about um, your analysts. You have, I talked about the advanced scout. Your other things that analysts should be doing, looking for patterns of play. You should look for item synergies, uh, combinations that might be really strong. Like what tends to win a lot? Like for example, we saw Lucian Nami almost almost 100% paired with Talia Nar. Talia putting a wall behind them so that Nami's tidal wave could have a finite ending point. And then when you get to that spot, Lucian could chase down again to a finite ending spot and with Nar's ability to crash them into the wall. It just happened over and over and over and over. Those four champions together uh, were picked in unison because of how good they, they work. You might see that. You might also see like, all right, let me find out what's meta. Is Ivern actually that good? What's winning? Why are the Ivern one tricks winning at 61%? Whereas other like challenger players are winning at 58. What are they doing differently? You talk to them, you find out what are they doing that's different. And sure, if you find out, hey, this path gets you level five, 30 seconds faster, but level three, a little bit slower. Can you improve on that? Can you find out these mechanics like this Q trick that Ivern did? Uh, to get multiple camps uh, cleared faster. Well, that's going to have an exponential effect, right, as the game goes on. Because you're able to get the resets on those camps a little bit faster. That means they respawn faster, which means you'll be able to do it again faster. And uh, that sort of adds up, right? First time, it's three seconds. Next time, you're six seconds ahead. Next time, you're nine seconds ahead. And that might be the difference between getting to level six uh, before the enemy team is ready, for example. We're getting to level 11. All right, but going back to the game state, uh, Garen versus Jax, you still see what Jax is capable of doing in this matchup. It's not necessarily a full-blown you know, full counterpick, but Counter-Strike comes up, completely erases Garen Q. And if you do that, then yes, you can, you can claim that you're going to win on that turn, on the turn that you use there. That said, Garen's spin still deals damage through Counter-Strike. That said, Counter-Strike's still mitigating a lot of the damage from it. You're also still getting the phase rush proc. So where exactly are, are these uh, counterplay windows going to come in? It's mostly going to just be from these uh, that level one kill. The fact that you have that extra 400 gold, the fact that you have the extra half level means that you will be spiking these levels just a moment sooner. Uh, and specifically, right now, looking at it, Garen was able to get this crash in with no teleport. This is especially important. You have to get these full crashes in. That will only cost you about two melees on the rebound. If you don't get this and you end up losing cannon, for example, then that'll be the difference between you hitting level six and not. Now, Garen's level five. He's going to be coming back to this wave. He's absolutely hitting six, and there he goes. He hits it right now. Uh, Jax will also hit six, but he's not. He's not six yet. So Garen is going to look to potentially freeze him off this wave or use the fact that he's six to glue Jax to the wave and look for a roaming opportunity. It looks like he's going for the ladder and yep. All right, so Jax is stuck to the wave. What is Garen going to do? Is it going to be some dirty farm? Yeah, there it is. Garen taking his level six saying, you know what? I'm plenty strong right now. I'm going to take these camps. I don't actually like oscillating right there because... It's not accomplishing anything. And I guess maybe there's an Ivern that could be in the bush and you maybe are presenting a juking pattern for them, uh, making it so you're keeping your APMs up. It certainly keeps your fingers warmed up, but at that same time, uh, I hope that you're looking at the map while while you're doing that. When you're casting Garen E, that is a perfect time to look at the map and reevaluate, make sure that you're making good decisions. But we see what Garen's able to get right there. Full, we have a double stacked wave. He uses his level six prio to get a proxy farm in and a raptor steal. And now he gets to come back to the wave. He's only lost one melee. So he was able to trade one melee for a raptor's farm. Not only that is it a net win for him, but it's a net loss for the Ivern. So fantastic to see this play. He's going to use that to springboard uh this this matchup for himself he does have a level advantage i'm surprised he's not taking it it's got to be because sejuani is in bot lane and he doesn't have the best vision he 
did leave behind that ward for himself at Raptors, and the fact that he didn't see Ivern means that he didn't know where Ivern was. The moment Ivern shows, you see how Garen stepped up and took a trade. Actually, it looks like he took the worst of that trade. But any trade that you take as Garen, you're totally happy to do it. Oh, the Q flash to get in. That's going to be a kill. Ignite ticking. No, the potion's going to keep him alive. But still, that's enough. You see the power. Man, flash ignite. You get the Nimbus cloak advantages. Garen's going to push this in. He's super, super healthy here. Teleport's coming in. He knows it. Doesn't even go for it. Gets the wave push. Doesn't go for a proxy. Notice that this time he doesn't go for a proxy for a couple reasons. One, Jax is there, and this wave is going to be disappearing, so Jax could come contest you. Second, you saw Ivern on your side of the map 30 seconds ago, so you know he's still there. Sejuani also not yet in position. So because of those changes, uh, oh my god, River's showing some wonderful mastery of Ivern here. Using Daisy to pull the Herald to the wall so that he can auto-attack from the bush on the other side. Beautifully, beautifully done. This is a trick that you can do on champions like Azir, uh, you can do it even with Anivia. Anivia can put the storm in there, and then you can put the wall down behind the Herald to make it sit. But those champions can't one shot. As um, Annie can, Annie can put the shields onto Tibbers, and you can take the entire Herald. Uh, Herald will turn around and put all of its aggro onto Tibbers. You can pop the eye. You've got two things attacking it, which means the eye will open more often. So it's wonderful, wonderful to see these uh, champions showing full mastery or players showing full mastery of their champions. Really, really cool to see. Uh, and if you haven't seen it before, that is a wonderful little trick to do and and ex extrapolate. Use it on all the champions. Maiden, right? You can you can throw your E over the wall at at the at the. <clears throat> Rift Herald, it'll charge to you. Your minions will tuck in behind it, and you can use Maiden and Cools to basically fight the entire Herald. You don't actually have the auto attack range on York to get the rest of the distance, um, but with Annie, you absolutely can. With Ivern, you can. Uh, and I believe you can even do it with Heimerdinger, but the I'm not sure that the ever since changes whether or not the turrets survive. You may just have to stack them up. Jax escaping for the moment, but the very end of the queue, good moves, but it's not going to be enough. Garen is just going to take over this matchup now. This is going to be a completed stride breaker as soon as he gets his fill of plates. They also... No, not also anything. This is what they're getting in spite of the Herald. Herald being popped in bot lane. Uh, this is interesting that they're using it only to get four plates. They're not going for the last ones. Uh, this is potentially a mistake. You could have pushed much harder here. You were stronger. There is no Garen teleport. You know that Sejuani was topside and just use multiple abilities. I don't like that they didn't go for more there. They could have gone for this fifth plate, gone for first brick. Instead, Garen's going to recall. And actually, it looks like I got the, the math off slightly because of the completed Berserker Greaves. Uh, Garen was unable. Even if they had gotten one more plate for themselves, they would not have been able to get not even the Kindle Gem. So we expect that he's sitting about 700 gold shy of Stridebreaker now. Which he will get once he finishes, whether or not he finishes the plates, but once he gets that turret, he'll be sitting back. Or if we just get a couple more rounds of farm, three more waves, plus a plate should do it. Oh, big ultimate proactive plays. Absolutely love it. See a flash trying to get a turn back, but Sheo uh, with the Sejuani passive and with Aftershock able to soak up all the turret damage. Very important that you take the turret aggro there as Sejuani. BDS getting stuff done. I absolutely love it. Now we're getting up to this 12 minute point where we're going to have Stride Baker completed. We're going to have Trinity Force. Oriana is probably going to be recalling maybe with the fully injuries right now with 111 farm at 11 minutes and with the uh, no plates might just be enough. No, it's not. Going to go for one more, one more pass at this. Now, this is a stage of the game that is very, very important that is underutilized. Herald is often down. Dragon is often down. People are close to their mythic timers, which tends to make people very predictable. They tend to sit in their lane and say, hey, I'm only three, 
uh, waves short of my mythic and that's what they go for, that is exploitable, right? If you know that people are gonna be sitting in their waves trying to uh, finish off an item, for example, then you can make high tempo plays and try to get the most out of it. Now, especially you look at someone like Ezreal that just finished Trinity Force, the magical footwear is online. He could absolutely be looking for a window to try to press for advantage here. Now he will check against Stixay whether or not Stixay has completed the Kraken Slayer. And it's not. It's not there. And we have a Kerchus Shard? What is this Kerchus Shard going to be for? Rapid Fire Cannon? Storm Razor? I don't think so. I don't like it. I don't know. I don't know what it's there for, but it uh, it's clearly slowed them down. It can be a good tool for for poking if you can uh, use the passive effect, kind of stack it up and constantly use it to poke with. But uh, I don't see that. I don't see that happening. Oriana's about to recall with the Andres. Garen is got his stride breaker. We see the bombies start, and this is what we were talking about with Sejuani, uh, or early on the game, last game. Bami Cinder is a completely fine item uh, for clearing. You don't get much more for finishing Sunfire. Now, Sunfire is a great item, but Bami's is a great item. And they just are great at what they do. And if you need a little bit of help with clear, it is totally fine to just grab that Bami Cinder and then build into something else. And it looks like that's exactly what Sejuani is doing. I don't know if we're going to see like an early Warmogs or something like Anathemas. I don't expect to see Anathema. Now look at what Garen's doing. Oh my goodness, I love it. Gods. Aptly using the God, God King narrative here based on the song. Absolute banger of a song, by the way. If you don't like it, let me know in comments why, because I think this is actually the best world's anthem they've had. The harmonies are great. The, the melodies are great. The chorus is fantastic. It's something we can all live by and champ by the only thing i think could have been a little bit better was the animation uh, i wish that they hadn't androgenized deft it's it's like they took him like let's take deft and give him a like ai 50 percent of all, every culture face i don't know that's maybe just me but they uh they did def definitely did not lean into the his korean features let's say that all right, we have backs. Caulfield's Warhammer picked up. We've got Bami Cinder. We've got Landry's Triforce. What are we going to see? We've got 1.3k gold lead. We've got the dragon spawning in three minutes. Now, Garen's going to go to the bot side of the map. This is because this wave has already been broken. Oriana's going to have a shorter lane right here where she can just go out to that wave. Oh my god, we just have one shot. Again, every time Flash is up for Garen, there is the potential for a kill. This is just the way he works. This is ever since the changes to Nimbus Cloak. Doesn't matter if you're playing Teemo. All right. Like Teemo was always the number one counter for Darius, Garion, and Nasus. It's just ever since Nimbus Cloak, Celerity. That combination means that every time Flash is up for the enemy, enemy Juggernaut, you can get kills into any squishy target. And that is how you should build basically 100% of the time. Uh, because that is going to be your job later, unless, you know, very rare situations. We've seen Darius picked into quadruple dive comp and saying, okay, like, you want to dive into us? Sweet, we've got a Darius, and and then we can just play for, I'm big, and that is what it is, right? Most times, you're just going to want that speed boost. You're just going to want to prey on the enemy AD carry. You just want to, you just want to use, or or mage, whatever it is. You just want to use that cooldown as best you can. Is that an ultimate? All right, it was ultimate being dodged by Zaya. All right, the Shockwave, I do believe, has a 20 second shorter cooldown. We'll see, we'll, we'll compare those as they come up, see if there's a window where we can get a second Shockwave. That's absolutely something we'll play with at the highest, highest levels, right? So we have mechanical mastery, and at this point, everyone has that. Then we have like champion mastery, all of the ins and outs of every champion, and we expect the pros to have that. We have macro mastery, which I don't think they've gotten. Tempo mastery, we know that they haven't gotten, although some teams have gotten pretty good at their checkmates, uh, especially the end games are there. There's still some room to, to be had. But at the highest, highest level, the extra 
advantage you have is being able to track cooldowns, knowing exactly where and when your champion is going to be stronger than theirs. For example, right here, they're like, okay, I know that we find this engage, we can take this fight, but now Zaya is going to be flashless, cleanseless, and ultless. So she is a sitting duck. How many people can take advantage of that and for how long can you do it? Garen is going to be the number one oppressor of Zaya right now. If, if Garen ever shows up near a Zaya, you can you can expect Zaya to just die. The, even the self peel with the root is not going to be enough. Garen's got enough attacks uh, move speed to get around that. Not only that, but he can just um, mitigate the root with his tenacity by turning on his W. And they're going to be fighting around those different cooldowns. But that's something that we'll be watching. This cleanse versus the rest of the engages. Sejuani is another person and Rakan that are going to try to be looking at Zaya right now. And we were right. All right, so Orianna ultimate is up and it does look like it's about 20 seconds sooner than Zaya's. 100%, this is an engage window. Zaya with no ultimate, no cleanse, no flash means no contest on this dragon. If they contest, it's kind of inty. Um, they've given up prior on the river. They cannot touch this. Zaya has no tools, so they're just going to have to give it up, which means that now we're talking about three dragons versus Garen. Now, one of the things that Garen can utilize most is a soul advantage, all right? When your team, when you can force enemy team to come to you, you can mitigate some of Garen's weaknesses, right? He always gets kited, right? That's that's the rub. Can't play Garen because he gets kited. Well, if you can force the enemy team to come to you, then suddenly Garen not, you know, getting kited doesn't matter as much because they're going to come to you. You can just put yourself between the place that they're trying to get to uh, and and them, right? So... There is still going to be range issues. Zaya and Azir have plenty of range to harass Garen. But even the auto range for Zaya, one auto attack is enough for Garen to, to Q flash. And there is no answer. And you are locked in that auto animation. If you are fast enough. Take a moment to appreciate that fight. If you're fast enough, you see an auto animation, Q flash Garen. Boom. Done. Zaya's dead. There's no, there's not going to be any counterplay to that. So it's really just going to be Azir. And if it's just Azir, then you say, okay, we just need to track one person. That's not bad. We can match this. And you see that this is what Golden Guardians is trying to do. They're trying to put Azir against the Garen, no longer with Jax. We have two items versus one and a half. Garen is going to start beating this Jax up. Even though Jax might have like the ultimate scaling, Garen has plenty of effective... Uh, scaling going on where this is the strength this is the point of the game where they're strongest two items is absolutely where garen wants to shine also this like level 10 to 15 window or even 6 to 15 once you start getting level 16 you start seeing three items pop up uh it becomes a little bit hard for him to exist in a world where azir can kind of rip him apart uh but in this game everyone on his team has a has a lead ezreal is the only one who's down a tiny bit, bit of cs but he's fine. He's going to finish man immune. And there he goes. He finishes man immune right now, right on time. As we said, 21 minutes was that break point. And this dragon's coming up in three minutes. Can Azir finish the second item? Can Ivern finish the second item? Can Jax finish their second item? They absolutely need this if they want to contest for this fight. All right, round number two, Oriana versus Jax. We had an easy win the first time. Jax is jumping in, trying to make the most of it. This can be Q into ult. That's a dead Jax. That is an ultimate into Azir, which means we have a dead Azir. This game's done. I don't mind that they went for the play. Uh, again, though, this is the problem. We have completed item on the Garen. That is a huge difference. You see that Jax is trying to make the most of it, but uh, you just get kited, right? And now, and now, like, now it's problems. You're dead. Your team is gone. They're going to take uh, Baron right away, which means that they're going to have the push for the dragon. That means they're going to lock in a soul. This is Cloud Soul for Garen, another soul that he absolutely loves. Again, he doesn't really want uh, Ocean. He doesn't want Mountain. He doesn't want Infernal, right? All of those allow people to fight him off a little bit better. Cloud and Chemtech allow him to move faster. And that's what allows him to get into this game. So, uh, you know, I don't want to say it's lucky for the draw here. But uh, but it certainly helps that they that they get these uh, Dragon Souls available to them. 
Zaya going for the flash play, saying, hey, we just lost the 2v2. Again, I will give credit to Golden Guardians to try to look for the play. The problem is that they're just not executing. They're not getting that difference. They're a little bit of a setup diff, not quite as many good, well-placed wards. And the execution, the, the button clicking has just not been there. Um, mechanics is the expression of what is in your mind putting it onto the screen. That is your mechanics, your ability to translate what you think of into the game. And and we just saw like Stixay going for an alt flash E pullback, not getting anybody, not even getting a chip, right? Getting so little off that the enemy team feels strong enough to go and engage into you. So now we've got Baron. They're gonna push up this bot side. Jax is correctly going off and getting some amount of push on the backside. Zaya is very good into uh, Baron waves. Azir, not the worst. Ivern, one of the best champions to have on your team in the entire game for siege situations because you can put that line of bushes down and you really want to disconnect them, right? What you don't want is three connected bushes that make a line because then if one single person in that line attacks, you will get a vision of everybody or one ward gets dropped. Inside, you'll get vision of everybody. Instead, by disconnecting them, you make it into two separate bushes so that whenever, when someone jumps and attacks out they can just step back in and out you can even do one one and then one in front of that with space a tiny bit of space in between that allows you to kind of jump in and out of those situations you never want to put it far enough out that the enemy team can use it for their own uh vision advantage but with this with this uh syncopation when you make that little space it makes us that your team can kind of pop in and out of vision this is what i was talking about you don't necessarily want this full you want to have a little gap because they're still not gonna be able to see through it, right? They'll, they'll see darkness here, darkness here, and light in the middle, and let them try to derive the information or put another bush further in front or further behind saying, okay, you can see this one little light, but these are all disconnected. You won't be able to see into it with just one ward. Uh, so that's something that River can improve on on Ivern, and we'd like to see that from the rest of players at Worlds. Cloud Soul with Garen, Cloud Soul with Sejuani, with Oriana, with Rakan. Uh, it's going to be very easy for them to pick their fights when they want it. You're going to see Fighter in mid lane and Four in bot lane in most situations. Uh, Garen looking like he's rotating over. He's trying to do it outside of vision so they can't really see that he's coming in because of how strong he is. Uh, but Azir showing his strength in this siege. BDS, uh, you know, got the waves in has a wave building right here and this is going to be this is actually this wave is going to be strong enough to end the game uh, and by end the game i mean kill the inhibitor um stacked wave we already have a double stacked wave with a third one coming in so it's ba basically going to barrel through this and very importantly it's going to collide with this next wave right here and because it's colliding right here that means the next wave is also going to collide uh closer to their side of the map and we're going to keep an eye on what this state of, whoop, what this st wave state becomes not only that, but because they have a level advantage, their minions are stronger. But you see, reinforcing, next wave is going to fight, like right about here. Each time it's reinforcing and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So if you're BDS and if you manage to siege these two lanes and this one starts building, suddenly you can just rotate over, bring your team over, keep Garen in mid, or bring everyone over by one spot, take the four stack mid and put Garen top and go fight for this wave uh, with momentum of this wave. Just keep on looking at that top wave, how it stacks. Also important to do when they're looking at these end game macro positions, do not push without cause, all right? You want to make sure that every wave that you touch has a reason, all right? Garen's fast pushing this, why? What is he going to do with this? What is he going to do? He's going to move into the other quadrant. He's going to try to secure some vision for himself. He knows that Jax is already collecting this wave and there's nothing him to do he could have maybe just sat on that wave waited for a little bit but by doing it this way he gets a little bit more vision he gets now to play up he's going to try to do it again this is cloud soul garen everybody so even though you've got four people trying to make a play here there's not that much to be done he sees now that the entire enemy team is here but there's nothing to be done leona Jax, ivern azir even zaya showing on this side of the map and now here's what we see. Ready what we talked about? Rotating people over to this wave. Look at the size of this wave. This is a triple stacked wave plus another wave coming in behind. 
Ezreal's already shoving them into mid. He's going to use his ultimate to keep this shoved, making sure to Q spam. Look at how many cannons are here. Is this three? No, they have only two cannons. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. They're backing away. All right. If you're backing away, it's for one reason and one reason only. It's to go shop and to consolidate your wallet. Uh, I don't like moving back right here. Azir, yes, he's going to have a good time clearing. But what have you actually accomplished? I wish that they had gotten significantly more. Beautifully done. Flash, cleanse. Wow. Cleanse for the silence. Flash to get away from, from the Garen. And ultimate to create more space and self feel. Maybe he didn't need to use all of those tools. But probably assumes that he needs to. Uh, to not get ignited. Get the rest of the way ridden in. Team's going to have inside track on Baron. They can forgo bot wave, right? Bot wave is not a threat to them. In fact, it's just stacking up normally. Uh, GG is not even going to fight for this. They're down 6k gold. They're going to pick up gold wherever they can. Now, Zion's on three items. That is worth noting. Also worth noting that Azir's on only two. Uh, Azir is supposed to be your number one way of fighting through this. Uh, fighting through the siege. And then Jax is supposed to be your split pusher. Yes, you have enough damage on the... Zaya, but because Ivern went for this fully support build, the Moonstone Renewer into Redemption, uh, which is largely based around the engaged team fight, saying, "Hey, the moment that the moment that Rakan ultimates, I'm just going to drop Redemption and be here for the fight, kind of be a shield bot, keep everybody alive." Uh, that doesn't really help Jax come back from this two items to three and a half uh, disadvantage that he's got going on. So Garen's going to keep on looking to press this. E into silence, multiple damage sources, and a level 16 ultimate kills the Jax. Yikes. Now Jax going for the max cooldown build, trying to ride Counter-Strike. Um, when you get silence to start a fight and you don't get that first Counter-Strike, it means that you won't get the second one. So even though you're going for the ability haste, you're not going to have access to that second Counter-Strike. I maybe would have preferred to see Seeker's Arm Guard here just because you're matching up against Jax, or against Garen. You're not matching up against the other people, right? You don't necessarily need the other cooldowns. The getting stopwatch and fiendish codex, yes, that's normally correct, but specifically it's Garen getting getting into one-shot range, and we just saw it happen. It means that he can just walk up in your face, and he's absolutely taking this game to them. Uh, and we see Moonstone Renewer is nothing when you're behind. You have to be ahead to go for defensive itemization like that. Um... BDS just taking it to him and slaughtering. Well played, BDS. That's what I will say. They played great. Adam's out of his mind. It's going to be very interesting to see how the world reacts to him. If he even makes it in, right? We still have a play-in stage. And BDS basically just earned their right to get into the play-in. But frankly, playing at this level, uh, Nuke playing well, some outplays. Maybe Crowny could be potentially a, a spot that can be... Uh, attacked by these elite laners in bot lane, but I don't know if those exist in play in stage as much. BDS is looking like they're going to be very strong, and if they can continue this and they can mitigate uh, any sort of weakness from the bot side and just allow Nuke and and Adam to play cracked out of their minds, like let's be real, they just carried these games. Um, there's going to be better laners than Gory. Licorice was was a great hope for America, though, right? That is that is one probably the best talent that has ever come out of our region. Um, maybe double lift, but Licorice is a much better team player. Double lift needs all the resources to be about him always. Maybe double lift is a little bit better, but uh, Licorice certainly from the top lane, best talent that's ever come out, and Adam just stomped him. It, it was uh, it was not pretty. There was a game, you know, that game, the cheese was real. A uh, uh, special special slice of Gouda for that top lane. But it will be exciting to see what BDS can do. I like their chances. If you're doing pickums, I would put them I would put them as getting out of the stage. Um, yeah, they just look really strong. All right, so I'll catch you guys next time. If you want more content like this and you want to let me get more videos out like this, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Also, you can check out gigagamingacademy.com. Make sure you check out the coaching section. We're doing special deals for Worlds. And everyone who makes it this far in the video, just timestamp uh, that you've made it this far in the comments, and I will give you a free lesson. All right, so I'll catch you guys next time. Keep it surreal. Peace.